welcome to the panel. It's going to prove to be a great panel, uh, good panelists. The thing I really want to remind everyone is that the 2020 elections are coming up, and this is a time that we need to galvanize and come together, not only as a profession, but as a nation, and really participate in the 2020 elections. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first panelist. I'm going to ask all the panelists when I introduce you, just give your name, your organization, and your title. And our first panelist is Mimi Abramovich. And Mimi, uh, I know that you wanted to say something about voting and social work, and then there's a couple of questions I'll ask you after that. So you're on. Mimi, you're on mute. Sorry, folks. Just trying to be careful. I'm Mimi Abramovitz. I'm the co-leader of the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign, nicknamed Voting is Social Work. And um, I share that with uh, Terry Mizrahi, Tanya Rhodes-Smith, Beth Lewis, Gina McLendon, and Becky Sanders. So I'll call out to the Social Work Voting, Voting is Social Work team. Um, and my day job, is um, a professor of social policy at Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College, CUNY. And so um, I'm going to address the question, how does voter registration and social work go together? That's what I was asked to do. So um, first of all, I want to begin by saying that social work is, and I hope many of you are listening to this webinar, have always understood voting supports a robust democracy, a just society, an equitable social welfare system. Now we launched the National Social Rate Voter Mobilization Campaign in 2016. And since 2018, we worked with major social work organizations, schools of social work, field education departments all around the country and registered thousands of voters for the midterm election. We plan to do the same for 2020 with your help. So the purpose of the campaign briefly is to raise awareness about the importance of social work, of voting to social work practice and social policy, to mobilize schools, faculty, students, clients, constituents, field directors, field instructors, the whole social work community to register clients and everybody, register us all to vote, but especially those who are targeted by voter suppression and gerrymandering. And we're gonna link social work uh, practice. So what we do, how we do, one of the things we do is we link social work practice. Um, we try to refute the myths that keep people from uh, participating in voter registration. And we train everyone in the social work community to register and get out the vote. The centerpiece of our work is based on our, our social work model where the hub, the field placement, field education, the internship is the center of our work. In other words, we have a strong relationship between the classroom and the field, and we think that the, the field is where the profession intersects with the clients, with the rest of society. The bottom line is voter registration reflects social work's long and strong civic engagement tradition, our commitment to making sure that everyone, but especially the disenfranchised, get to vote. Now, COVID-19 and the Black uh, Lives Movement has upped the ante on all of this. Both have explored major flaws in our electoral system and in fact throughout our wider society. And that these, uh, these flaws, if you will, pose major challenges to a widely accessible, inclusive, inclusive electoral process. That's what we're trying to uh, deal with. So be part of history. Join the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign and check out the Voting is Social Work website for all sorts of information and resources and sign up on our mailing list. Thank you, Mimi. I do have a question for you and this question will also go to the rest of the panel. What exactly drove you to really get involved with voter uh, registration and voter participation and voter engagement? Well, thanks for that question because it, it made me stop and think a little bit about this uh, when I was thinking about um, this panel. So when I was younger, this wasn't so long ago. <laughs> I, um, I was a regular voter, but I wasn't always enthusiastic about voting because I didn't always like the choice presented to me by the candidates. I voted, but you know, they used to say you pick the lesser of two evils. Um, but then I also participated in the civil rights movement 
and I valued its victories, especially the right to vote for everyone that the movement won. And I began to realize that voting is the most basic right in our democracy. Democracy depends on accessible, inclusive electoral process. Now that sounds simple. It makes sense to me, okay? Yet, we know that it took pressure from social movements to get there. Many gave their lives. Women fought for the right to vote and 2019 was the 100th anniversary of the suffrage movement. The civil rights movement got the 1965 voting rights, 100 years after the civil rights movement. So back to me, I was upset to learn that these laws, these important laws were very poorly enforced. I was angry when the voting rights came under direct attack in the 1970s, 1980s. And I was enraged when after the election of the nation's first black president in 2008, frankly, all hell broke loose. Voter suppression resurfaced with a vengeance. These new poll taxes, which how I think of the voter suppression, broke my heart and tore me apart. So when my colleague, Terry Mizrahi, asked me if I would join her to create and co-lead the National Social Rights Voter Mobilization Campaign, I said, I screamed, yes. That's it. <laughs> That's Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, Deanna, you're next. Uh, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, for me, I grew up and I've been born and raised in North Carolina. And uh, approximately four years ago, under Pat McCrory um, and a super majority Republican legislator, um, voter suppression was full steam in North Carolina. Many of the policies and legislative um, agendas that they made, they tested them out here in North Carolina, specifically and strategically and surgically, they targeted the black vote, as well as college and the elderly. So for me, seeing that up in, up in person and, and also being personally affected, seeing many of the people in my community and family affected, it made me want to get into helping people register to vote seeing where people could be charged um, or, or get financial penalties for just helping people to register to vote. I just thought it was so outrageous. And so I wanted to be part of the solution, trying to figure out how we can help register people to vote without, you know, getting charges or them trying to take away souls from the polls the Sundays where a lot of black communities get together and go to the polls, especially in North Carolina. That's a huge tradition here. And so a lot of the laws that were put in place primarily affected my community. So that's what activated me. Great. And Cheryl Aguilar. And Cheryl, could you give your name and, and your uh, organization and, and title? Yes. Hi, everyone. So great to be with you all on Friday, right before our weekend begins. Uh, I'm the founding director and therapist at the Hope Center for Wellness, and we're a mental health practice focused on holistic healing of individuals and communities. We're based out of Washington, D.C. And when I'm not working with, uh, at my practice, I am supporting uh, the social work profession through some of my involvement in organizations like the National Association of Social Workers and CRISP. Uh, the Congressional Research Institute for Social Work Policy, and a group that I founded called Social Workers United for Immigration. Um, so to answer that question, what I'm seeing uh, that is a theme among my, my colleagues is that for us, this is personal. For me, this is personal. There's no other choice. Uh, I don't see it as another choice. We, we turn on the news and we know that our country is, we need to take it back. And, and this all began for me very early on when I grew up in, uh, growing up in Honduras, uh, I migrated when I was 14 years old, but growing up in Honduras, I, I, at a very early age, I was, social justice was instilled on me by my father, who grew up from poverty and worked really hard to become a lawyer and a congressman in a third world country. So I have memories, uh, my, my father just passed uh, a month ago, and so I'm flooded with memories at this moment. And one of my memories growing up with my dad was going out with him to get up the vote when he was running for, for as a congressman. So, so it's really kind of neat to see where we are now and to kind of see the beginning for me where this began. Um, and one of the things that I saw growing up with my dad and just in general growing up in a third world country 
is that when we are given the opportunity to lift our voices, we feel empowered. And that's my wish for our clients, and that is my wish for our community members. So I know voting to be a tool to make voices be heard, and I want to be a part of all of you, uh, and I want to invite all of you to be a part of this campaign to make sure that people feel empowered and elevate their voices, and we build a country in which everyone can thrive. Thank you, Cheryl, and condolences on your father's passing. Uh, Alberto, uh, what, what was your motivation? Thanks, Mel. Uh, so I wear many hats in my community. I'm a community organizer and policy advocate. I'm a doctoral candidate and grad assistant at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work. Uh, but the reason that I actually got involved in this work was because of my studies in health disparities and health inequities. Uh, so I've been really invested as a, as a researcher, as a community organizer, and improving the overall health of my community and realizing that health has many facets. Um, it's about physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health. Then the health as a macro practitioner, as a community organizer, the health that I'm, I, I seem to be really interested in is the community base, the collective sense of health, uh, the ability to mobilize, to feel that you can contribute, to make significant differences, not just at a, a local or state level, but at a broader or a federal level. So when I was invited to take part in the uh, VODR Healthy Democracy team, um, I'm, I'm the only social worker on it, uh, but I get to work with awesome social workers to develop partnerships with uh, Diana, who's the founder and editor-in-chief of uh, Social Work Helper, uh, which has been a great partner with us. Um, voting is social work, Dr. Abramovitz um, and her whole team. Uh, show Aguilar as a clinician um, to, to, to be able to have that, that sense of how is it in, in terms of a clinician's perspective. You need those multiple perspectives and you need that type of coalition building in order to affect change. So the aspect of ODR, of health, the Healthy Democracy Team that I really enjoy and I think makes us successful is that we're able to engage with our partners in ways that are so mutually beneficial. And realizing that civic health is more than just about voting. It's about being able to call your legislators and to say, I need this fixed or I have this demand. Uh, it's about even considering running for office or being, uh, or being part of a campaign for a, a candidate that you really feel passionate about. It's about taking the census. Hopefully all of you have taken the census. Uh, so there's so many different levels of civic engagement. Uh, and to be involved in that, especially during COVID, especially during this public health crisis, when people are fear, fear, so fearful they become apathetic, then we need to do something to elevate their voices to, to make sure that they know their vote, this basic human rights, really matters. Great. The next question actually is a really, really important question. I'm going to start off with Diana, but as you know, we, we serve as social workers vulnerable populations. And Diana, what do you think about what barriers are out there to the populations that we serve to uh, for voter participation mainly and certainly as actually casting a vote? And then I'm gonna ask everyone else uh, the same question. Well, right now with COVID, there's a lot of extra barriers because communities of color are being overwhelmingly affected by COVID contraction. And so now not, only are there barriers to getting to the polls that we normally fight, then there's the actual barriers of going out could actually cost you your life. So we're dealing with many challenges where we can't go in front of Walmart as we used to in the past and get people to fill out forms and help them register to vote. So now we're having to, I think, lean on technology more. Uh, we've been doing that in our communications with each other, but I think we should also lean into using technology to help people register to vote. Um, via online using the, the various tools that we can use um, to help people register to vote where we can do it from our computer and still help minimize those barriers. Um, we're still living in an age where there's a digital divide, um, especially here in the South. Um, 
where a lot of people who are in metropolitan and urban areas, you know, having access to a smartphone or internet are things that um, are commonplace. But here in the South, that's not necessarily the case. Um, it's, it's a challenge to have people who have phones and internet access. So being able to, when we look at using technology tools, we have to also take that in consideration and use a variety of tools that can not only capture those who have access, but also capture those who are limited by um, technology as well. So those are the things that I've been working on, um, trying to figure out, especially me and Alberto, we have been working with Voter ER um, you know, combining our systems so that we can capture both those two parallel tracks of people who have access to digital tools and then those who lean on email when they don't have access to internet and a reliable phone source. So those are some of the barriers that we've been seeing and how we're planning to work to get the vote out for this election. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll go to the same question first with uh, uh, Mimi and then Alberto and then Cheryl. So Mimi, well, I th I think respond to the, the same question. Yona, you highlighted, I think, the key most current things that are going on. I'm just going to add a couple of things that um, part which is, um, pertains to social education and then voter suppression. Well, first of all, I think that a lot of people, um, what gets in their way of voting is they don't have any information. They don't know whether it's students, clients, faculty, anybody. They don't know who the candidates are especially in more local elections or in the midterm elections. They don't understand the voting process and, we, and they're not given enough information about that. So one of the things we try to do is begin to integrate this into social education and train our students to do this and our agencies. Um, I think a second major barrier touches on, uh, just add to what you said, it has to do with voter suppression. Now this is basically designed, it's a very intentional. I just saw the movie Rigged last night, if any of you try to get it, it gives you the history of voter suppression. It is mind boggling. But anyway, it's designed to demoralize the electorate, all these things, make people believe that voting doesn't matter, and that the system is rigged, there's that word again, and your vote doesn't count. So here, I just want to name some of the things, because it's a long list, and we forget, because we only hear about them every once separately. First is gerrymandering, voting districts to favor the party in power. Last night I learned that um, as soon as the Republicans came into power, they, they, they had a deliberate strategy to get control of the state legislatures, the governorships, and gerrymander. And now if you look at a map, you can see how many states are gerrymandered, which is a distinct advantage to the party that's not in power. They're purging people from the voting list. People are purged. I think in North Carolina, you saw a lot of, we've seen stories on that all the time on television. Now, is talk about weakening the postal service. Well, we need to vote by mail due to, due to COVID, right? And now the idea that the postal service will have not pay people for overtime, that they're being slowed down. People won't uh, think that they vote, that, that, well, why should I vote? My vote's not gonna get registered, especially if it's an absentee ballot. Absentee ballot and vote by mail are the same thing, although sometimes they are treated as two different things. Then they ended early voting. You know, there's some communities where early voting is key and Sunday voting and all sorts of things that many states are ending that. Then, of course, there's the introduction of voter ID laws, which particularly affects students who are out of state, but affects people who don't have a driver's license and et cetera. Um, disenfranchising felons. We had some progress in um, actually restoring the vote to the felons in Florida, but then Florida uh, took the step of weakening that by saying they had to pay their fees and court courses, which becomes like a poll tax that they have to pay to vote. Um, so there's, there's a, a range of intimidating and deceptive practices about the vote, all targeted. And it's, I just have to say, this is not accidental. It is mean-spirited. It's very deliberate. And this is um, one of the things we're up against because the people who oppose a, a broader franchise have changed the structures of our country to make it very, very hard. So all the more reason we have to get people to stand on those lines, go to those polling places, find where to vote, and just, uh, just um, do the best they can. And that's what this campaign, what Voter ER, what this webinar, which what all of us are working so hard um, to make happen. But just watch out for those voter suppression because we have to work around them. They're not gonna go away. Thanks, Mimi. And uh, Alberto, if you can pick up on it, and perhaps you can even talk about, you mentioned the issue of uh, the census and maybe sort of fold some of that discussion in there. 
here now, culturally, I think a big barrier is the hyperpolarization that's happening right now in terms of our politics. I mean, we're seeing it very much at a federal level, front line and sinker. Um, and it's really distorting a lot of people's views of local politics. So um, I have canvassed for certain candidates um, and talked with constituents and uh, for certain parties. And often, even if, it's, um, even if I'm advocating or I'm campaigning for a local candidate, they'll say, I hate the, that party. I hate those people in, 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 the, in, the, in of Washington. And I'm, I'm telling them, I'm not talking about Washington, I'm talking about <laughs> my local candidates, which, is, which can be vastly different. I know in Connecticut, um, vastly different than um, the federal. Uh, but this is a barrier, I think, that a lot of people have told me on the phone they will not vote because they just feel that this is so polarizing. There's this hyper politicization. It's just about politics. It's just about lies and dishonesty and isn't about any sense of truth and authenticity. And so, and that's really tough to respond to, um, especially when um, another thing that kind of comes to light that um, I, I, I take issue with, it's a loaded term, but some of you may have heard of cancel culture. It's a very loaded term, but to me, what I mean by that is when some, you, write someone off because they just don't agree with you. This often happens on media um, and it often destroys careers um, and it just, it, 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 sometimes it destroys lives. Um, and there's different perspectives on that, that cancel culture. But for me as a social worker, in terms of my values, um, I don't have to agree with you to be able to help you or to be able to give you, offer you resources. I don't need to have all my values aligned with yours. Um, I need to be non-judgmental. I need to have, so this is where some clinical aspects come, unconditional positive regard. Like I need to have that kind of uh, relationship with you. So I've, I've worked with people all across the aisle, different conservative, libertarian, uh, liberal. Um, and I think that's like, that's kind of the beauty of politics. So like right now, I'm working with people who really want to substantially reform the police, but then there's some that want to defund and abolish. I don't write out either, just because I don't agree with certain elements. Uh, as a social worker, as a community organizer, I want to find the common ground and see how we can really change society and you know, the systematic killing of black and brown people, um, eliminate racism from our law enforcement, from the criminal justice system. Those are all things that even people, whether you refund, you want to reform or defund and abolish, that's what you can agree on. So trying to find that and trying to see where we can join on, on different strategies. Um, so I think when it comes, I'm going to go into the census, um, just like Dr. Brumvis was uh, making point about like myths about voting, there are myths about the census, like um, that if you're, um, if you're undocumented, um, ICE is going to knock on your door. And that's not true. You can't, it's confidential. Um, so, but there are bits associated with doing the census. So, um, you know, I think trying to really educate people about what it means to do the census, that it's about being able to fund your community. Um, it's about making sure your community gets the resources that it needs, that um, you get, that your state gets the number of representatives, um, a fair representation in Congress. Um, knowing that it impacts people directly, in, you know, in, at their doors, in their homes, um, that's what, um, you know, because as much as I'm a community organizer and as much as I love bringing about that sense of collectivism, people are going to act in their own self-interest and people are going to want to know what's in it for me. So I tell them this is where, th this is how voting impacts you and this is how um, your votes can mean, uh, can, can make a difference in terms of different resources you have access to, different social services you have access to, including healthcare, employment, housing, et cetera. If I could just say one thing now, uh, just to follow up on uh, Alberto's first point, the national system of voting is nonpartisan. This is nonpartisan um, because that's what we think is the best way. We want to register everyone to vote, but it also deals with the 
uh, the Abelja race about it. we don't want to politicize it or we don't want to put it together. So we're nonpartisan. And so that makes it possible for nonprofit workers and nonprofit agencies, workers in public sector, to actually legally and professionally register people to vote because under the Hatch Act, that is allowable. And although a lot of social workers think it isn't. So that's another thing when we talk about it. There's another kind of barrier is a myth, which maybe we'll get to later. Thanks for that clarification, Nini. Cheryl, if you can ask the same question and certainly speak from the perspective of the Latinx uh, community. Yeah, thank you. I want to echo what my colleagues have said. And just to add a little bit to that is, you know, in this age, uh, there's a lot of cynicism and distrust of politicians and faith in American institutions. And, and that poses as a barrier. If our community members do not trust the system, uh, they may be less likely um, wanting to, to engage in the system. And according to, uh, to research by Gallup, some, uh, there's even distrust of traditional institutions, uh, advertisement, including media. And, and research points to people are more likely to get engaged in voting or be engaged in the democratic system when they hear, when they're incentivized, and when they're empowered by people they trust. And that is us. And I think that's why these efforts are so critical because we already are in a position where we're developing relationships with, with our clients, therapeutic relationships, or we're engaging community members at the METSO level. So this is where we all come in now. Uh, we serve as the trusted sources that our clients and community members need to hear from. Thank you. I just want to stay with you, Cheryl, on, on another question, maybe more unique to you because you do do a lot of clinical practice, and that is an important uh, part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I got to tell you, I the reason why I'm so passionate about this work and, and being involved in, in voter engagement is because I was one of the skeptics when it came to how do I engage clients in clinical practice. I didn't know how to do that. Most of what I know, uh, my primary role in my practice is to provide uh, therapeutic interventions. And I had believed, and, and I don't know where that idea came from until I, I actually challenged that idea that um, I couldn't talk about these kinds of things with clients because it would take them away from the uh, what they brought to the therapeutic space. And, and that is true. We do not want to take away uh, space uh, uh, in our own agenda. We don't want to come as a social worker and, and jam our agenda on clients. But I started to realize uh, very quickly in my therapeutic work that everything the clients were bringing up is related, is connected to politics. And so I started to kind of learn in, uh, about how to do this. Uh, I, I turned to research, I turned to literature. Mimi, you have written plenty on this as well on how to engage in, 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 in a clinical setting as a social worker, how to engage. And I started to look for opportunities. I think that's one of the things that as clinical social workers we train to do, we look for possible opportunities. And, and looking at it from that solutions um, perspective, solutions focused perspective, client, and, and when we look at it from that lens, uh, voting is a potential solution for many of the challenges the clients are presenting. So, so I don't come in there saying, hey, let's talk about where you're at with voter registration, but I listen for opportunities. When I listen for barriers about getting around town, when I listen, I listen for, for stories like, uh, what does my, my work schedule looks like around uh, on election day? I listen for those opportunities and, and I engage clients with the therapeutic tools and skills that we, that we learn in school uh, in, in helping them come up with solutions. And, and that one of the reasons that I appreciate some of the tools that are being provided to us is that they're very subtle. Um, I, uh, I learned when I worked at a clinic that I wanted to uh, engage clients on, on issues or I wanted to present the information to clients on issues that were important to them, but because I didn't want to take space away from from the therapeutic space, I use more subtle ways to share information. Like I, I would have flyers around uh, topics that were important to my clients, like on healthcare reform, on immigration and so, but since we're doing everything by video, we don't really have that necessarily that opportunity. But, but we do have a way to connect with clients and share some of the tools. Um, right now, our clients, and I think the pandemic is a crisis and crisis sometimes present opportunities. Um, right now, a lot of clients are anxious around how to get around. 
and and with the tools uh, one of the biggest conversations that i'm um when the topic does come up in sessions is how am i going to get my vote out how am i going to do this and i know that uh alberto may talk later on around the democracy kit and diana as well about her uh her voting kit uh these are really easy tools to engage with you share a link and someone uh applies or, or uh, submits information to receive their mail-in ballot. I actually did it right before this call using the vote ER uh, tool. So um, if my, my recommendation to anyone who's, who was like me, who may not know how to enter this space and, and do micro and macro in that clinical space, it would be, let's look, let's turn to the code of ethics, the, both the NASW code of ethics and the clinical association of social workers code of ethics points to uh, our um, call to action when it comes to engagement and there's research and there's articles out there that uh, kind of walks us through that line uh, actually through the mental health specialty section of the National Association of Social Workers we released an article earlier uh, this spring giving you uh, how to engage clients in the therapeutic space so if I could just add two little tidbits to that in terms of the big, big policy picture, which goes right with what Cheryl was talking about. First of all, there's something called the National Voter Registration Act. It was enacted in 1993. And it says that people are allowed to register to vote at the Motor Vehicle Bureau, but also at uh, public and nonprofit agencies. So when people, so a lot of social workers think it's illegal. They think it's unprofessional, which is what Cheryl was just talking about, but they think it's also illegal. There's a law since 1993 that says we're allowed to do this as in the ages, in the settings where we work. And then I mentioned the Hatch Act. The Hatch Act says you're not allowed to engage in partisan political activities. You can't campaign for your favorite candidate on the job, if you're, especially if you're a public sector worker. Well, but the Hatch Act also says that you can register people to vote in a nonpartisan way. It does not disallow that. Those two laws are work on our side, and we need to let people know about them because it helps us counter these ideas that we pick up along the way that social works have to be objective, that the law doesn't allow us, that it's unprofessional. So that we have a lot of information, myths to bust, and these are some. I think maybe you've frozen, and it's using a Wi Fi issue. Uh, what I'm going to do is go to Diana because what's, what's being touched on here is the issue is should social workers work, reach out to their clients uh, if it's at the workplace or anywhere else uh, to mobilize them to get them to register their vote. I agree that some folks think that's illegal, but what's your opinion, Diana, about whether this is a barrier or should be be putting that out there to folks or what should we do? Well, well, here in North Carolina, we actually have some real data on this. And this was because of the, all the court cases and the voter suppression laws that were put in place. Um, they actually had to go back and do a study and look at all of the public departments to see where they actually strategically tar targeting black voters. And what they found here in North Carolina, especially since um, 2016, registrations by the Health and Human Services, which a lot of people don't realize that social workers are included in that DMV law where we are not just supposed to, but we're required to register our clients to vote. That's a requirement that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to offer them the opportunity, help them register to vote. Registrations under, like I said, Pat McCrory and the super Republican legislator um, went down 60% from Health and Human Services. So social workers were one of the agencies that strategic, well, it had to be strategic because it went down by 60%, right? So this wasn't just a failing, a system failure. There was a, a climb where we were registering the most vulnerable. And then in 2016, 2016, there was a steep decline. So that was one of the strategic things that were done to target health and human services to limit those registrations. Now, typically where people think getting out the vote or helping people to register becomes a partisan issue is because it has been politicized. Republican parties, they do better when voter registration is low. 
when there are less voters. In Democratic Party, they do better when voter registrations are high and voter turnout is high. So there has been a calculus that the less people who vote, um, this is, you know, depending on which party, that's the strategy they're choosing. If you're Democrat, they want more people registering to vote, more people turning out, and just the opposite for the Republican Party. So this is how this issue has become partisan, but it should not be partisan or politicized. We should encourage, no matter what party, um, for Americans to exercise their constitutional right to vote. Um, but that has been one of the challenges that we have struggled with as a country forever, um, depending on who has you know, the power, whether you know, not letting women vote, not letting people of color vote, then you know, whether we're you know, trying to prevent you know, felons or immigrants or whoever, we have the vote is the tactic that's being used to limit people um, power. And so this is why we really have to focus on um, not really seeing GOTVs as a political issue, but also a way to create community, create, create civic engagement. Um, one of the things I always talk to people when I say get out the vote, the first response that I get is that I really don't have time for a huge organizing effort, right? Um, it's just too much. I'm focused on, you know, protesting or I'm focusing on, you know, whatever issue that's important to me. And I'm like, I totally get it. I said, but this is the thing. If we don't turn out the vote, all of those issues won't get heard. Our civil rights are in decline things are not moving in the direction of more rights, they're moving in the direction of less rights. So if we're not engaging in our vote, we may actually lose on all these issues we care about. And then the second thing that I tell people is that it's not a huge organizing effort. You know, is it a huge lift to send someone an email and say, hey, are you registered to vote? Here's the link, it takes two minutes to register. If you are registered to vote, Here's another link, check your status, see if you're active, see if your polling place has changed, see if your polling place is closed. And then third, if you are good to go, email this to your friends, right? That's your, you're getting out the vote. It's just that simple. Um, to do that, it's not a huge lift, but if you wanna be more engaged, host a virtual town hall. Talk about all those issues that's important to you. Get all those people who care about that issue to come, be on the panels, talk, and then say, hey, while you all are here, are you registered to vote? If you're not, here's a link to register to vote. Here's the link to check your status. And hey, while you're at it, send this to your friends. That is how we create community, that social contract to get people registered to vote. It's not a huge organizing effort. It's just one person doing one small thing, asking those who are closest to them to do the same thing. And that's the Get Out the Vote campaign. Thank you. And for time <clears throat> management, I want to give Alberto, I don't know if I asked you to answer this question, but I also want to give both of you guys a chance to talk about your toolkit. So Alberto, did you want to respond to this, this issue of working with clients? And you're on mute. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are two things. Um, I would like to talk about. Um, first, August is Civic Health Month. So it's a brand new month um, that um, it's like an offshoot of Vote VR. And it's to um, show how civic engagement is connected, directly associated with health on all those levels I was talking about previously. So encouraging not only voting registration, but voting by mail, um, voting safely during the pandemic. Um, taking the census uh, and, and, and knowing about who your, your representatives are, your local representatives, and just becoming more knowledgeable in, in that sense. Um, so um, I'll put the, the website in the chat, but there are a lot of great resources, including uh, social media toolkits, posts that you can use. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really big on social media. So if you're big on social media, we got a lot of resources for you and other events um, that, that are happening uh, revolving around uh, Civic Health Month. Um, secondly, um, it's the uh, Healthy Democracy Kit, which is a resource that's used to help register people to vote, but also 
um, if you can want to vote by mail, there's also an option to do that. So um, one of the ways is to order, um, if you order less than 10, it's free, um, but there is uh, a way to do bulk orders um, and you can customize it for your school or for your organization. So the typical social work one um, comes with this badge here in the lanyard and the badge has a unique QR code that your client or community member with a smartphone can just scan and it takes them to that. Do you want to, you're going to, uh, uh, are you registered to vote? Um, or you can also use text messaging, which is text vote SW, vote social work to 34444. So that's another way. Um, and uh, we've partnered with Social Work Helper. We'll be developing a page so that people can do it via this way or they can do it via email. Uh, and then um, in hospitals, the way I first learned about it was in hospitals, um, they have like a kiosk uh, where you can actually register to vote. So you can register patients immediately to vote. So that's, that's one form. But this is actually the Healthy Democracy Kit. Um, there's also like, uh, if you're waiting for this, if you're antsy and you're waiting for this in the mail, um, you can print it out or you can put it on your phone um, as the wallpaper. Uh, so it's a really great resource. We've had a lot of social workers order it from all across the nation, use it, post it, share with friends. Uh, you know, my, my biggest thing is to just get the word out as to how uh, this tool can really be used to start that conversation about the importance of voting, whether you're working in a clinical setting or in a non-clinical setting. And Deanna, did you have a kid also that you were working on? Yes, I do. It's not quite finished. We're going to be launching it pretty soon. Um, and just like with Alberto, there right now you have the social. We have the Social Work Helper app that is active. This is where you can download the app. You can register the people to vote. You can register yourself, or you can check your status. You can find out all the local politicians know who you're voting for. There's information um, connecting NASW's page and all of their recommended or endorsed um, folks that they put out each year. So that's available. Um, so we're going to also be doing a virtual GOTV campaign that we're going to be launching this month. And this is so that we can weaponize email and social media as well to help get out the vote. Because like I said, we don't have those traditional places um, that we can go register to folks. So we're going to get people who are already doing outreach to show how we can, how you can add on just an extra layer to capture other people, to get them to register vote, to know, um, you know, their status. Because like I said, sometimes having a smartphone or having access, but people tend to have email. And, and, and that is a way that we're gonna try to register people to vote via email and social media. And also one last thing, we do have the anti-racist um, summit, virtual summit that's coming up where we're going to be focusing on advocacy, anti-racism and voting. And you can go to globalsocialwelfaresummit.com to view all the speakers that we have and what we're going to be doing to focus on um, voting and getting out the vote. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go into our Q&A session. I'm actually going to take a moderator prerogative to ask, ask the first question. And it has to do with your opinion on a call to action, one of the biggest issues in terms of barriers out there is this issue of mail and voting uh, and the uh, counter struggle that we're having from the Trump administration uh, to basically sabotage that process. Do you all have an opinion how, how we can mobilize social workers to just be out there and vocal about not letting that kind of stealing of the election uh, process. And that goes to Mimi's voter suppression uh, discussion, too. So I tell, Mimi, I'll start with you. Well, uh, Ms. Ms. well I think um, we have to disabuse people that, that the, the myth is that the messages of the, social, the post office has failed. So we have to constantly, there's tons of information around that that's to, a total big fat lie. Um, but we also, in other words, to get to motivate social workers, I think we can talk about the benefits of voting to the people we work with and ourselves. And so this operates on the individual level um, that 
I think it's been mentioned, it's a subject with higher levels of health and uh, well-being. Cheryl mentioned that. It's a voting with better social connections, better employment opportunities, opportunities, and a sense of individual efficacy. So if we want that, we got to get the vote out. It's, it's, um, it's a benefit to the community. And this, I think Fiona mentioned this, that the, the communities who vote in higher numbers get access to more resources. The legislators listen to them, so we got to get the turnout high so that the things that we want the government, local, state, and national to do for us, we have a voice in that process and they listen to us. And voter turnout is one of the ways we get that voice out. And finally, for the profession, um, voting represents our values and our mission. But it elevates, I think it's even a word that NASW is using in its campaign, it elevates our uh, professional voice, our visibility, um, and, and the benefits come not just to us, our clients, but to the whole society. If individuals, communities, and the social profession can get people out to vote, we all stand to gain, 100%. Yeah, thanks. And, and the only, again, the, the question is, getting social workers really involved in, in that kind of activism calls to action. I, I absolutely, I agree with Mimi 100% that, you know, by one, by having this panel and us being able to talk and come together so that people can see the, the community and collaboration between all the different groups within the social work profession, I think that's going to help motivate and, and get people activated as well. And by all of us working collectively to put our tools together, I think that's gonna give people a way. A lot of people want to do something, they just don't know how to help. So by us making these tools collaborative and also accessible to people, I think that's gonna help activate people as well. Um, so the only thing that I would add is that I think it's really, really important um, to put out information, not only about GOTV, but using companies like Lyft, who do um, free transportation to polling places um, on, on um, voting day. I think we need to be purpose purposeful in trying to reach out to companies that help support voting um, and see if we can create collaborations with them, you know, through or, you know, social work power and organizations that have, you know, some social work power, because we are the ones that work with the most vulnerable. And I think it's an opportunity for us to you know, create those private partnerships, private public partnerships with those organizations who are trying to help. But I think working with social workers could be more effective. LIF is one that I have seen where they have reached out to like individual social workers. And on a broader scale, I would love to see some of our social work organizations reach out to them and say, hey, this is what we're doing and we want to support. How can we work together? So I think on a macro level, um, connecting with some of those people while doing the work that we're doing as far as kits and things on a micro level um, could be hugely impactful. Thank you. And Bertha, same question, uh, getting social workers involved, really getting involved, call to actions and activism. I think that we need to expand our definition of what a social worker is. Um, I went into social work because I realized very early on it wasn't just one thing and I didn't need to go into it with, I could go into it with taboo interests or with controversial um, views or um, because I knew the social work community would welcome me, they would be open-minded, they would give me the feedback that I needed, they would need the support that I needed. Um, so. I think that as social workers, we need to realize that the, our roles in terms of voting registration, that we're nonpartisan, we're not, we shouldn't tell anyone who to vote for, um, but we still, as advocates for social justice, as um, uh, for individual self-determination and autonomy, um, all these other values that we hold very dear, it's very much intrinsic to that. Voting is very much inextricably linked to that, um, to those values. Um, and that there's a way we can do this work where, you know, 
I don't believe personally in safe spaces. Um, I believe in brave spaces. So I believe we need to be comfortable with leaning into discomfort and not doing things that are out of our comfort zone um, and try to do at least one thing out of our comfort zone every day to challenge us. We may not do it really well. We may stink at it at first, but you know what? It's worth a try because even when we get our BSW, MSW, PhD, DSW, we don't stop learning. We don't stop just, um, uh, we're not the experts um, completely. <laughs> we're still learning. We're still, uh, we still have a lot to learn from others and from our communities. So I take a lot of, I take the position of cultural humility and uh, in saying that, um, I'm still realizing how important voting is. Um, and I'm still trying to go against my own sense of comfort um, and those narratives that I was kind of said like, this is the kind of social worker you have to be, or this is the kind of community you have to be. I'm resisting that. And I'm doing it through the support of the partners, the panelists here, the partners of Vote ER, um, through my social work colleagues and friends. I have their support. So in that sense, I don't need to be afraid of doing the wrong thing. What I should be afraid of is not even trying and not doing it, and not, not attempting, so. Thanks, Roberta. And Cheryl, I know that, that you've been an activist for a long time, uh, but could you just share with us, first of the importance of that social workers really being not just trying to register the folks, but being very active and, and co having calls to action. Absolutely. Um, as a clinical social worker and as someone who works really hard to on my own self care and setting limits and boundaries, uh, one of the messages that I normally say to to social workers engaging in work in any type of work, clinical, meso, macro, is it's important to honor ourselves and and take an inventory of where we're at emotionally and what is our bandwidth. And one of the exciting things about the tools that we're presenting and, and what and just to kind of recap what Diana mentioned is that um, one of the questions when I that I one of the answers I hear when when we try to engage people to join social justice efforts is I already have a lot on my plate like Diana said and, and we have so many tools at our disposal that are easy to utilize if there's fear if there's still that question about how do I engage my clients and, and even after you explore you do not want to cross that line there's many other people you have access to and if you're at an agency setting what I normally recommend is maybe it's not you the person engaging clients maybe it's someone else how do we do this as an agency level how do we do this as an organization level um, so that's you know in terms of call of action uh, is we have no choice, but we also need to honor ourselves where we're at, and, and we cannot do this alone. I have been in the space of immigration for a very long time, and, and one of the things that we have seen recently is that together we have defeated many hateful rhetoric, many hateful policies like DACA. We were able to fight really hard to ensure that DACA was upheld, and now you know there's a new announcement that. Uh, new DACA recipients cannot apply. But what, what I have seen in my work is that alone, we can do so little, but together we can do so much. So if it's not you, engage your friends, engage other people around you, and everything adds up. And one of the, the encouraging things that I have seen in my work in the last few years, uh, especially in the last administration, is for every attack, for every hateful rhetoric, for every hateful policy put out there, the community has come together and we have won many, many wins. So, so this is what this is about. And now through voting and voting engagement, we can, ha we can potentially have, it it's a win, no matter who's, who's at the White House, it's a win when we're able to elevate uh, our voices and when we're able to engage and empower other people to do the same. And just to kind of share a story, I know we're closing, but one of my first tech tools that I ever used to engage someone uh, uh, through technology in voter registration was a tool that was uh, promoted by Diana by the social work helper and it was a teenager who was uh, turning eight who, who had turned 18 and didn't know anything about the process and through like a really quick text was able to sign up 
and to register. And it was quite remarkable to see that excitement for that person who was going to vote for the first time. So uh, voting is a social de determinant of health, and we can put, and he could potentially enhance this health self-esteem and sense of empowerment of individuals. Thank you. There are a couple of questions I'll try to get to really fast on the audience. One was directed at, at Mimi uh, and uh, uh, voting and social work. The question is simply, how much outreach and much work are you doing on college campuses? How much work we're doing on college campuses? Right, as far as registration. The whole, the, this, this voting and social work works, we're endorsed by 22 major social work organizations, including NASW, Voter ER, Council on Social Work Education. We're working with the deans and directors. So we're doing a trickle-down strategy. We're trying to get like this, this um, a webinar, all sorts of information through our website to the people on the campuses, the faculty, the administrators, the field instructors, and we're providing them with resources and information so they can reach out to their students and to this interns in the agencies and use these tools of the kind that are presented here and others to register uh, people to vote. Then it, on the campuses, many campus social work campuses are doing, the students are getting active, they're, they're tabling voter registration, they're doing a lot of the things that were discussed. Um, but we, we are hoping to spark that. We are too small an organization to monitor all that, to make all that happen, but we're hoping through these networks that we're part of, that we can get the word out with through resources and tools and all this um, exciting information and getting people nervous about not voting that they will um, mobilize on the campus level, but also in the field placements where I always say social workers are ideal, ideally positioned to do this work because we are located between the individual and society. That's where the social worker is in the agency. And so they're perfectly located to do this work if they feel comfortable, not afraid, uh, encouraged, excited. And the absolute last question is from the audience. <clears throat> it's really dealing with the skeptics, uh, given that all these issues out there, for instance, to our, our postmaster general, whatever his title is, supposedly slowing down the elections, all these things that folks were saying, what's, why should I vote? I'm skeptical about this whole process. Anyway, so quickly, if any one of you want to sort of respond to that, feel free. Well, while people are thinking, just tell people their life, their health, and their future depends on it. <laughs> I, I just want to add to tell, you know, for folks to know that GLTV in this election is more important than ever before. Because with all the voter suppression, all the barriers to getting the vote counted, we have to over deliver, which means we have to bring in people who have not been voting before in order to make sure that we over um, have the amount of people that we can bring into the system. We can't count on just the folks who normally vote because through suppression, through purges, through whatever means to suppress the vote, that's going to eliminate some people's power and getting their voices heard. So that's why we got to over deliver. We got to bring more people in, which is going to help us try to put our thumb on the scale to make this a fairer election. So that's why GOTV is extremely important in this election cycle. And uh, Alberto and Cheryl, do you want to chime in? Yeah, um, this is not what I would tell a client, not in this work. I would probably construct it in a clinical question, perhaps. But if we don't vote, they have won. And they is the system that are trying to oppress us and trying to stop us from getting involved and us not have a voice. So that's my quick answer. And one, one last thing before we go. I saw a question about people asking questions about protests. Should we help people register to vote at protests? And here's the short answer to that. Um, you know, I, I, I applaud all the people who are out putting their bodies on the line, protecting our First Amendment right to assemble. But at the same time, if we don't vote, you're putting your bodies on the line for nothing because we won't have that power to get the people who are going to lead to follow our lead, the social work lead. So we have to vote as a second part of this. So yes, if you're out there, 
this is where these tech tools become important. Have the Social Work Helper app where you can help people register and vote from your phone. That way you're out there, if they're out there, they care. Let's find a way to get them registered to vote, locate their polling places so we can make them active. Let's turn that protect, protester into an active vote. That's what we should be doing. Thank you, Dan. And obviously we are, we're actually past our time. I really want to thank all the panelists. This has been a tremendously good discussion, very informative. And I uh, also want to thank uh, C Civic Health Month for inviting us to be a, a, a part of this. So, and I don't know the next steps. I'm saying that we're finished. So I don't know whether or not Alex has any other closing comments. Oh, no, that's it. Like I mentioned in the chat, I'll be sending an email to everyone who attended as well as those who weren't able to attend today with um, the contact information for all the panelists, as well as a recording of this so that you can spread it to your networks. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for a great conversation, panelists. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody.